article to the editor. Uh, it's due on April 22nd. So that's a date that's starting to approach. Uh, so I know you're all furiously working on it. So keep going. All right. So let us uh, review where we were. Um, right. So. Well, one of the well, things we talked about on Friday last week was uh, a, the, a particular paradigm that is quite important in quantum optics, uh, looking at the damped quantum simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, uh, so there's many ways to treat it. Uh, the standard approach that we take that is typically appropriate in the quantum optical context is the so-called caldera Leggett model, which was a model that was also discussed in the context of condensed matter uh, and thinking about dissipation uh, in condensed matter systems. And the model is the damping of a, an oscillator which is coupled to a reservoir that is consisting of other simple harmonic oscillators. Okay? And so we could go through the same kind of derivation that we did for the two level atom coupled to the um, ensemble of oscillators that constitute the quantum mechanical vacuum uh, and derive the mass equation in the same way, in, in the same. Born Markov approximation. So, uh, under the assumption that our bath, in this case, all the modes that can leak into or out of uh, the cavity are at, in some thermal state at some temperature, then we um, arrive at this master equation for our system oscillator. So as an example, a typical example is that might constitute a mode of the quantized electromagnetic field inside a cavity. And that mode can uh, dissipate due to either absorption at the cavity mirror or scattering of some defect into some random mode or transmission through the cavity mirror. And we get a mass equation in the Lindblad form, just like we had before, with uh, Lindblad operators corresponding to creation or annihilation operators that correspond to processes of losing photons uh, out of the cavity or thermal photons entering into the cavity. Okay, and so one thing we uh, looked at last time was just how do expectation values of some typical observables evolve under this kind of dissipative evolution? And so we can do that, uh, we can solve for the uh, sort of the Aaron Fest theorem like evolution, now including the dissipative term, um, and it has this form in this particular case. Okay, That's just a matter of playing around with the commutators and so forth. And so, for example, the equation of motion for what the mean number of photons inside the cavity does as a function of time, it's uh, just a damped an exponential damping equation with, in this case, a steady state that's determined by the thermal energy of the photons in the black body. And so the solution we can write down immediately. Of course, if, this, if we're at zero temperature or the number of thermal photons at the temp frequency, this is, of course, at the frequency of the cavity is effectively zero, well then it just decays to effectively the vacuum. 
And if we were to say, look at what the mean field does uh, inside the cavity, then that is exactly like the complex amplitude of the classical oscillator, exactly the same. It oscillates and decays with the decay uh, given by this uh, constant kappa. Okay? Of course, kappa is related to these things from the usual kind of um, Einstein A coefficient type thing. I mean, kappa would be equal to 2 pi the sum or the integral over the density of states But typically, we don't calculate it that way. There's a de decay rate of energy in the cavity, and that's kappa. Okay. Now, one of the things we discussed at the very end of lecture last time was, although this expression is not surprising, it's what we know classically, how a classical amplitude would decay. If we think about it a little bit more deeply, from the quantum mechanical point of view, it's actually a little bit surprising. Because, as we know from our studies, the, um, what the mass equation tells us is what are the transition rates, kind of Fermi Golden Rule transition rates, between different levels that are induced by this perturbation. In this case, the perturbation is the coupling to the outside modes. And that rate is given by the square of the matrix elements of the Lindblad operators. In this case, the Lindblad operator uh, for emission is proportional to the annihilation operator with the constant out front. Okay? And that rate is proportional to and where I start. Whereas here, the decay rate of this amplitude is independent of the amplitude. So how in the world does that happen? Well, as we discuss at the end of lecture, this is an example of what's called the transfer of coherence. The point is that if we want to look at the um, rate of decay of the mean field, that mean field depends on the coherences, right? That is to say, it depends on off-diagonal elements. Between different Fox states. So the rate of change of this thing depends on the rate of change of the coherences. And the question is, how fast do those coherences decay? Now, one of the things that's special about the simple harmonic oscillator is that these energy levels are equally spaced. They're all spaced by the frequency omega. Which means that um, if we started with a, a state that had, if there was a coherent superposition of the number of states, it was, a, say, a coherent state, then the way in which those coherences decay, that's a particular superposition, depends upon whether or not there's information in the environment about which level decayed. If there's no 
distinguishing information in the environment about whether this decay happened or that decay happened, then this coherent superposition will be transferred to that coherent superposition. So it's not generally the case that the effect of spontaneous decay is to get rid of all possible superpositions. It depends on the nature of the decay. Yeah? Sorry, do you, so if there's no information, then a coherence between two states that you don't know which one decayed becomes a coherence between the next the the state. It's transferred to those states. two states, correct. Is there not some still some probability that it could be in the highest state, which they now know? Say again? So there's three states involved. There's the top one, the middle one, the bottom one, and it goes from the top one, the middle one, to the middle one, the bottom one. Sure. So this is not to say that coherences don't decay. They do. It's just that they don't. The, you, one has to look at this, the, the, if the coherences didn't decay at all, well, then this would be constant. What all I, the, the point, I mean, to, to go through the details, the point I'm trying to make here is that the, one has to go through in detail to see how coherences decay and how coherences are fed. And it's the detailed balance between them that ultimately determines what the overall decay rate is. And in this particular problem, if you go through the algebra, what you find is that rate at which the superposition decays is independent of n. And the only way that can happen is if there is a feeding tensor. Another example of that is if I say had, for example, I have a, suppose I have a multi-level algebra. So, meaning that suppose I have an atom which has degeneracy. So let's say I have this atom, say it has some number of degenerate sublevels. Okay? Uh, this is, say, some ground state that has a total angular momentum, in this case of, I don't know, three halves. Okay. And, uh, Suppose there's some excited state up here that has some, I don't know, has some other. It's a allowed transition, say J equals what happens to the hand. Right? And now I suppose I create a particular superposition of two of these sublevels. And I now drive the system with a laser field that say there's a selection rule that says I drive from this state to these states. Okay, these are sublevels within the degenerate subspace. There might be a situation where this decays and that decays. And if there were this superposition, that superposition would be at some level transferred to this superposition. That's a transfer of coherence between the two levels. Now, typically, that transfer will not be perfect because typically the Pythagorean coefficients for well, this versus that are different, which means uh, that um, if I see a photo, suppose this had a larger Pythagorean coefficient than this one, that means if I saw a photon, it's more likely that it decayed from this kind of absorption emission than this one, because they have, this happens at a quicker rate. But it won't be a complete destruction of the coherence. It just will mean that those off-diagonal elements will decay much, much, much less than if, uh, you know, for example, I saw this colored photon, which is a completely different color than that one, if there's a different magnetic sub if there's a hyperfine splitting, then that coherence would be destroyed because if I saw that color, I know that it came from here. Okay? So those kinds of details uh, would be 
need to be put into you have, uh, have to when we have our multi-level systems we have to think carefully about that question of the transfer of coherences now there's one last point I want to make about this that is a little bit subtle suppose that I broke this degeneracy by applying a magnetic field we have a Zeeman splitting between these different magnetic sublines. Okay. And let's say drive this, this system. Okay. You know, it can have this kind of spontaneous emission. So what was here and here now gets transferred to here and here. Do I lose the coherence or not? Well, it kind of depends on, clearly if I put the tiniest, tiniest of magnetic field and just broke that degeneracy by a tiny bit, that can't be so different from not having a magnetic field at all. But if this magnetic field is sufficiently big, at some point it seems like these two are distinguishable because they have different colors, and I can tell whether this spontaneous event happened or this one. But how does that work in the math? Where, at what point do I say the coherence is transferred? And at what point do I say the coherence is not transferred? Well, that's a subtle point. And one of the subtle points here is that the distinguishability by color is a little bit different than, say, the distinguishability by polarization. Why do I say that? Well, the time is not quite the same kind of variable in quantum mechanics than, say, spin. So if I saw, you know, a different polarization, then I know this is a sigma plus and this is a pi polarized light. That is or they are orthogonal states. And if I saw one polarization from the other, I'm entangled with orthogonal states. And when I trace over that degree of freedom, the octagonal elements are zero, period. Okay? On the other hand, distinguishing a color from another color, how do you do that? Well, you have to take a measurement for a certain amount of time before you can distinguish enough cycles of a sine wave that you can tell they're different. So somehow this is a more of a temporal evolution than just an entanglement with another degree of freedom that we trace over. And so this is a more dynamic, this question of whether or not these two photons, which are the same polarization, are different frequency or not, we have to come into the dynamics. In other words, we would have the Zeeman splitting, we put u dot b in the Hamiltonian, and the interaction between that u dot b and, well, in this case, not this Hamiltonian, but the one that involves, you know, absorption emission of, of photons in the atom, would compete in such a way that at some level, at a short enough time scale, I wouldn't lose those coherences, but over a longer time scale, I would, because over a longer time scale, I can distinguish these two frequencies. And that should come out of the math. And it does. It took us forever to figure that out. It's got confusing a lot, but yes, that's how it works. All right, any questions? Yeah? So just to, I guess, try to connect that to something we saw earlier. So if you had, what was it, stimulated Raman transition, where you have a third layer that, or a third level that you're kind of uh -huh. hard to tune from. Yeah. I mean, is it the case that basically in that situation, the greater your detuning is, the lower your loss of coherences? Because basically those, or those, um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, basically. It's so if I had like a ladder, a ladder type transition, or a lambda, or have, say, levels like this on yeah. two different laser beams. 
Is that what you're talking about? A spirorama transition that, say, stimulates from here to here? Well, let's talk about having the same initial situation that you have um, an initial coherence between two levels that are at slightly different energies. Okay. And then you're displacing them down such that they end up you know, with the same spacing, but basically the, you know, the levels that you're displacing to are not, um, I'm trying to say here. Here they are. They're yeah, displaced. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you have. What if he's a chalk? Come on up. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you, you start out with uh, coherence between the middle and the top. Okay, the these guys, right. Yeah, and you have one, either one or two levels um, at the very top. Right. That are, you know, you have two levels and they're all completely degenerate. Uh, I mean, which is the, the situation that you were just. Yeah, I actually was being sloppy about that. Oh, Because, okay. of course, typically what will happen is you will get a Zeman splitting in the excited state as well. I just didn't draw it. Uh, so, I mean, I, I might have a Zeman splitting up here as well. Now, the yeah, question yeah. of the whether or not coherence from here gets transferred to here will depend also on not just the quadratic coefficients but the detunings. So for example, if this guy is farther from resonance than this guy, well that will mean that if I see a spontaneous decay, I have to wait, this, I would have to ask what's the scattering rate. That scattering rate will depend both on the detuning from the excited state as well as the quadratic Okay. All that would have to be appropriately folded in. Okay. I think that answered my pseudo question. <laughs> <laughs> There's no stimulated there, which is why I got Okay, okay, okay. okay. All right. Good. All right. So, let's continue. So, um, let's now look at other aspects of this damped oscillator. Let's, for example, consider the evolution of quadratures. So, say we have some quadrature of the field. those same expressions we had over there and ask how does the quadrature, the average value of, say, a quadrature of the field evolve. Here. Let's just look in the rotating frame. Let's forget about the free evolution of the oscillator. Okay? So it doesn't really matter. It's just not an important part of the discussion at the moment. Okay? So, well, that's easy. Each one of these guys just decays. So this thing, the quadrature amplitude decays as the mean field. What about um, the fluctuations, though? Let's look at the evolution of the square. And, and we don't have any oscillate? Ah, because you, you're working in the rotation. Yeah. Right. Um, OK, so now with this guy, we got to plug this in, and we get a half. Dagger, the commutator of A with this squared plus the commutator plus what am I doing here? It's the expectation value plus the expectation value of X squared. Uh, commuted with a dagger, a. Okay. 
Okay. So you just do a little bit of algebra on that, which I won't bore you with. You can do that. It's easy enough to do those commutators. And um, <coughs> and what you get is minus kappa n bar plus 1 times the square of the quadrature minus a half. plus kappa n bar times plus one. Is that right? No, plus a half, yeah. So that's from these two terms. The master equation. Okay. Uh, and so what we see yeah, I guess the way I wrote this is, is, I'm sorry, this is not quite correct. That's what, why I'm being confused. This expression is not true. It can't be true. There's no kappa in there. There's no n bar in there. It doesn't make any sense at all. What it, is, what it should be is the sum over the Lindblad operators, L mu, L mu. And in this case, there are two Lindblad operators. There's the emission one, which is the square root of kappa n bar plus 1 a, and the emission, the absorption guy, is square root of kappa n bar d dagger. That's correct. So now you get that. And that says that. Uh, these guys cancel, and you get minus kappa squared plus kappa n bar plus a half. we see here is that the fluctuations in the quadrature, if I plug that in over here, well, in this case, uh, you know, we have the same equation for this, fluctuations, let's see. solve that. Tells me that the fluctuations in a quadrature evolve such that the initial fluctuations decay and then in steady state my fluctuations equation. So, for example, suppose at t equals zero, we have a squeezed vacuum. So that the state was a pure state with an initial uncertainty in x which was, say, for example, squeezed with the squeezing parameter r, and the momentum quadrature was anti-squeezed. Okay, that's my 
initial minimum uncertainty state. What happens when I put this squeeze state inside the cavity and that cavity doesn't have infinite finesse? Well, it will lose its squeezing. And if we look at the particular case where, say, we're at, at zero temperature, say n bar is zero. Which is typical of optical frequencies. Then the steady state is what? Well, the fluctuations the half in all directions. That's the vacuum. So if I were to sketch in a kind of phase plane picture, what happens is the following. Suppose initially I have a spin, a, a, a squeeze state. It has, well, uh, I shouldn't be tilted, but it should be upright citizen. It's squeezing along x, and you have to squeeze it along t. As over time, what will happen is, well, the mean field will decay. The mean field will decay with rate kappa over 2. And the fluctuations will be such that over time, this nice squeeze state will get chubbier and a little bit chubbier. And then ultimately, at, it's supposed to be at all times a minimum uncertainty state. I don't know if I feel it quite like that. But at the final time, it's the vacuum. Okay? It's kind of interesting in this particular case that we start with a pure state and we end with a pure state. And intermediately, it's a mixed state. Because intermediately, it's not a minimum or T Gaussian wave packet. It's something which has a product that's different, typically greater than the minimum uncertainty. Now, as we discussed and we looked at this problem in a, you know, just intuitively, Earlier in the semester, when we discussed squeezing, and we looked at the sensitivity of squeezing to loss. So one way to model this kind of the master equation is to think about the, the idea that there's a, a beam splitter with some transmittivity, which case at some point, some, every once in a while, a photon can be reflected from this beam splitter, and the rest of be transmitted. And that ability, the fact that these reflection events are individual photon events, whereas squeezing had to do with the correlations between photons, is why the dissipative effect tends to remove the squeezing. Because it will get rid of those correlations. Yeah. It also removes the coherence. Did you say that? Is that right? Or no? So it, it remains pure state? Or? No, it does not. Okay. It's, it's only pure at the very end. It starts as ah. a pure state. And it's only pure for the vacuum uh, state? But in the, in at, well, at time t equals zero, it started in the pure state. Yeah. At, in the steady state, it's also in a pure state. But then we've seen things like that before. It's not so. It's a little bit odd, but it's not that odd. I mean, for example, suppose I think about the block sphere. Okay, and uh, I start in some coherent position of ground and excited state. Well, what's going to happen to this thing? Well, it's going to go. It's going to spiral in and eventually go. So it starts at the pure state, it ends at the pure state, but intermediately it's a mixed state. Okay. Um, but there is one state that is different, and that is what if we started with 
a coherent state. Well, what do we know about this state? Well, first of all, the, the mean of this is just going to decay. So it's going to be the initial guy. Right? Um, but uh, what about those fluctuations. So suppose we start the situation where we have, uh, again, zero temperature, and we take our bath to be the vacuum. So if I look at that equation, what this says is that the fluctuations as a function of time, well, I have e to the minus kappa t, the initial fluctuations, the initial fluctuations in, in that case are y for, for coherent state. The variances are just a half. A half, right? So that's a half. And then I have plus 1 minus e to the minus kappa t times a half. Right? So at all times, this is a half independent of time. So in the case of coherent state, the picture is just as follows. We start with the coherent state, and at all times, we're a coherent state with exactly the same variance. In fact, the solution to this problem is that. That is to say, the state is always pure. Its mean amplitude is decaying just like the classical amplitude is. But the nature of the coupling to the vacuum through the beam splitter is such that it doesn't change the photon statistics. And that's unique to the coherent state. That is to say, if I have send a laser beam through this, and that laser beam, if I break it up into chunk, that has Poisson statistics of the number of photons in any given chunk, Poisson randomness of reflection keeps Poisson statistics of the output beam. And so this thing, at all times, has exactly the same statistics. Now, this kind of property of maintaining the pure state as a pure state, that is to say, this state, if for all times, the entropy of rho is 0. The, the particular state that had that property was determined by the nature of the coupling between the system and the reservoir. And that was something that uh, was, that idea was developed over time in thinking about what kinds of states are robust to the coupling to the environment. What kinds of states, if you put them in superposition, lose that superposition, lose that coherence in the superposition, and what kinds of states maintain their essentialness and maintain the, their property? And that's the whole question of decoherence, which is what I want to spend the remainder of the lecture talking about. One thing we learn immediately from this result is the idea of what's called, what 
So decoherence was something that was particularly uh, analyzed and studied by Wojciech Zurich. And one of the ideas that came out of Wojciech's uh, decoherence program was the idea of what we call the pointer states. Those are states that are picked out by the nature of the coupling between the system and the environment. That is to say, we want to ask the question, which class of states maintain their coherence and which states are kind of the states that we would call the pointers of the meter that uh, are robust to that coupling. How would we determine that? Well, one way to define such pointer states, this is something that came out around 1993 in some work with Salman Habib, was the idea of a pointer state was, were the states that minimized the entropy generation. Why is that an important idea? Well, as, we, as we've discussed before, if I have um, a, a state that is a pure state, it has zero, zero entropy. If the state becomes impure, or I should say a state that is uh, no longer considered a coherent superposition, but a statistical mixture, well then in some sense the environment picked out different alternatives. So we want to look for the states that minimize the entropy generation. We can study that by looking at the Lindblad master equation. So in particular, let's, um, the easiest way to get at this is instead of thinking about the entropy, I'm going to talk about the so-called linear entropy, which is another word for purity. So remember that for a pure state, the trace of rho squared is 1. So we're going to look at the linear entropy defined as 1 minus that. That's just, if, if, the, if we're close to a pure state, the von Neumann entropy is essentially that. What's called the linear entropy? OK, so let's ask the question about how this uh, evolves as a function of time. Well, that's equal to minus the trace of rho d rho dt plus d rho dt rho. So now we can plug in our Lindblad form of the mass equation to see how the linear entropy changes. And what we get is the following.
So now, if we are looking for these pointer states, let's assume that the state, if the state started pure, we're looking for a state that stays close to pure. Okay? So we can approximate this expectation value by treating rho as something that's close to a pure state. In which case, for states such that rho is approximately some pure state, then this rate of change of entropy is approximately equal to minus the sum mu factor mu minus mu. That's by taking that approximation. Yep? What it really means is that for all, I'm looking at S's that are approximately 1, or at 0 in this case. I start with a state that's a pure state, and I'm looking for the situations that the nature of the coupling of the reservoir maintains it close to a pure state. I'm seeking those solutions. Okay, so obviously there's always, this is not perfect, or at least, well, it is in the case of the coherence state, but we're approximating it this way so that we can write this expectation value. If I call this a psi, then it's just the expectation value of that thing times the material of that thing. So the solution we see thus is that the rate of, for these states that are near that, this rate of change of linear entropy is approximately equal to minus delta L mu squared expectation value, where L mu, delta L mu operator acting on the state is the operator minus its mean value. So, what we've learned from this little exercise is that the pointer states are the states that minimize this fluctuation. In the case of the damp simple harmonic oscillator, what is L? Well, if we're talking about at zero temperature, our Lindblad operator for the damp simple harmonic oscillator, which is just the annihilation operator for the cavity mode. And so the state then delta L is zero. That is clearly thus a state which will actually exactly solve this equation. So, so the entropy doesn't change at all. But generally speaking, we can find the pointer states, the states that are robust to decoherence, the states that are not destroyed, their coherence is not destroyed by the environment, by asking what is the nature of, actually, of course, it should be the sum over all these guys, that minimizes the sum of those fluctuations. And again, you come back to a question you've asked before, Amir, I mean, of course, these things aren't exact, but what must be the case, and it is true, is that whatever unitary remixing we do, that sum is independent. Of you. It's, it depends on the nature of the coupling, uh, the physical coupling to the reservoir. So this is, this idea 
has generated an industry for decades of trying to do what people call reservoir engineering. That is to say, if I want to protect some particular class of states from decoherence, can I do that by engineering the environment in which it sits in? Engineering the couplings to that environment, giving that environment a certain structure such that there are a certain set of Lindblad operators associated with that bath that would then protect the state. It's a hard thing to do. I don't think it's ever really been done very successfully, but it's an interesting idea. It's an idea that says we can somehow affect whether or not some positions survive or not by coupling them appropriately or trying to protect them through the, a particular coupling environment. It's a hard thing to do because there's usually a natural environment out there that if it wasn't there in the first place, the superpositions would stay. And they don't stay because of the natural environment. So putting in some other environment isn't always an easy thing to do. But it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Yeah? Can you see the uh, coherent population trapping as a form of reservoir engineering? Or is that kind of a completely different um, I, You know, I think that it is. I mean, I think dark states are indeed a form of that. Uh, and in fact, the idea of the dark state spawned the, the idea of what was called a decoherence-free subspace. You may have heard of a DFS if you're a quantum folk person. And, and that's really the same idea here, right? You're looking for states which are decoherence-free because of their particular coupling to the environment. So I think that is a, a, a good example of that. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry? Yep. So does it mean that this time evolution is reversible? No, it does not. Well, there's a few things I would say about this. First of all, the block sphere is, it wasn't, is not the particular example we're studying. This is for a two-level atom uh, coupled to the environment rather than a simple harmonic oscillator coupled to the environment. The simple harmonic oscillator, we said, you know, had different properties because there's lots of levels. This was the two-level atom. So there's different ways in which this system decays than that. However, even for the oscillator, it's not this, a pointer state is not a state that undergoes a, a coherent evolution necessarily. What we showed is that if I started at time t equals zero in a coherent state, then at a later time, my state evolves. And in fact, evolves irreversibly to the vacuum. It's just that it always stays a coherent state. So can you write a unitary though? Or would it just be like a reverse displacement operation? You could. You could. I mean, at, at every time, at any time, of course, we, it, we know. It, it, I think that's a fine statement. It's just that when I, when I really meant by irreversible is that the evolution on its own doesn't reverse itself. This thing goes to a steady state. Of course, we could. I mean, if you know that, and we do, if I have a cavity and that cavity leaks, I can maintain a steady state by feeding in a laser. And the thing will, and so that's exactly what you're saying. I'm displacing this back always. So this thing wants to go to the vacuum, and I'm constantly pushing it back away from it. All right, now this idea of decoherence, um, we want to get at this a little bit more deeply. And to do that, it's convenient and also useful for, from other perspectives to look at a, the particular representation of uh, our 
density matrix, not in terms of the Fox space, but in phase space. And to look at the Wigner function or the P function or your favorite order quasi probability distribution. So let's begin the discussion. What I want to look at is the phase space representation. Lots of ways to do this, and it's done in different ways in the quantum optic textbooks. Most of the textbooks do it in terms of Glauber P representation. Let's look at it in terms of the bigger function. This is a little bit more general of the procedure that we'll use. So let's recall the bigger function. We had written that as a Fourier transform. of the characteristic function. The characteristic function is kind of the Fourier transform of the probability distribution. It is the expectation value of the displacement operator, which is the trace of rho with d. Okay. So, now we're going to allow everything to depend on time. The state evolves as a function of time. And thus, this is the representation of the state as a function of time. And so the time evolution of our quasi-probability distribution is determined by the time evolution of the characteristic function. And that guy should not have been starred, but that guy will be starred. All right. So we need to calculate this. So the time evolution of this is equal to the trace of the displacement operator with the time derivative of the density matrix, which we now plug in the Lindblad-Master equation. Again, let's do it in the rotating frame. Okay. So this is going to be equal to minus kappa over 2 n bar plus 1, uh, the trace of a dagger a with d plus, oh, I'll be right out right in the lab, sorry. A dagger A rho D plus rho A dagger A D minus 2 A rho A dagger D minus kappa over 2 N bar trace A A dagger rho plus rho A A dagger minus 2 uh, a dagger rho a all times d. Okay? All right. So how is this going to help us? Looks like a mess. It is a little bit of a mess. But I do want to remind you of an important point. 
which is that one of the things about the characteristic function, the reason the characteristic function was originally introduced in probability theory is that it's the generator, generating function for calculating moments of a distribution, right? So, for example, the expected value of A is equal to, well, let's put this in. This is e to the beta alpha dagger minus beta star alpha. This is equal to the uh, partial derivative of the characteristic function with respect to uh, beta star evaluated at beta equals zero. Right. So what we see coming out of here, we want to look at, I mean, this thing, of course, is A with the row. What we see here is uh, the trace. Yes, the trace. Thank you. Is those kind of moments of distribution. So it's a it's a messy calculation. It took me forever to do it because I couldn't find it in any book, and that means I had to do it, and I always make mistakes, lots of them. Uh, but I did do it, and I hope someday to write these notes up. Um, but um, let me just write down the answer because it's a mess. But in order to deal with this, what you have to do, let me just give you how it actually works. You need to, uh, you know, what we need to have is this thing in the right order. We need all these guys. When we take this trace, let's write this out. Let's look at an example. This this whole stuff over here is equal to the expected value of a dagger a d plus the expected value of b a dagger a. Right, because when you do the cyclic property, you get that, and then you get minus two uh, a dagger b a. Right. Now this looks. This is good. This is equal to the partial derivative with respect to minus beta star, and the partial derivative with respect to beta of the characteristic function. But this stuff is not, because it's in the wrong order. So what you got to do is commute. And you can do that because you remember this. d on a is equal to d and this is a minus alpha is mm -hmm. So this is a d minus alpha d. So you, you, you move the displacement operator through all these guys. And you accumulate all these terms. And it looks like this. <laughs> and it's a nasty little thing that took me all afternoon. But I did it. I think I did it. And here's the answer. Now we can get to that. So what you find is that the time evolution of the characteristic function is equal to minus kappa over 2 beta star v minus e beta star plus beta e by e beta on the characteristic function minus kappa 2n bar plus 1 beta squared on the characteristic function. That just comes from 
you know, com commuting everything through so that you can write everything ultimately as derivatives. This is what's left over. Okay, so that's the characteristic function, but what we want is the Wigner function. So we've got to take the inverse Fourier transform. So every d by d data becomes a multiplication by alpha, and every d by d, every multiplication by beta becomes a derivative, right? Because it's a Fourier dualities. Multiplication in one space is a derivative in the other. So what you find is the following, and this is we're getting towards the final answer, and we will. Moreover, it's more convenient to write this in terms of the quadratures, the real and imaginary parts of alpha. So if I write alpha as x plus ip over root 2, and d by d alpha then is 1 over root 2 d by dx minus i d by dp, and d by d alpha star 1 over root 2 d by dx plus i d by dp. And you put all that together, what you get is the following. That equation has a name. Anyone know what that equation is? What if this term wasn't there? That equation you recognize? Diffusion. The diffusion equation. But this isn't the diffusion equation because of this stuff. This is what's known as the Farquhar Planck equation. Now, I'm sure if you've taken a class with the Tom Kankery, you've seen <laughs> the Fokker Plan equation. So there's no excuse that no one recognizes. I know you've all been taking classes with Professor Kankery. Uh, this is the Fokker Plan equation. And this is the equation that describes the evolution of the quasi probability distribution in the presence of this thermal bath of oscillators. So let's just look a little bit before we end this lecture on what is sort of the, what's basically going on with the Fokker Planck equation. Let's just uh, study that from a, just a general perspective, not necessarily like the, the point of view of quantum mechanics per se. So let's just say, let's look at this simple case. Let's consider we have one, uh, one random variable. Let's call it X. 
and we have a probability distribution on that of that random variable that is changing as a function of time. Our, our probability assignment. And let's just so we're going to look at the case that it has the following form. And some coefficient we call m1, the derivative with respect to x, x times p. This, I'm sorry, I couldn't yeah. actually call it w, but I'll call it p, because it's always called p in probability theory. Plus n2 over 2. So that's the Fokker Planck equation in 1D. The coefficient m1 is known as the drift coefficient. And the coefficient m2 is known as the diffusion coefficient. Why are they called this? Well, we already know the diffusion will come, come back to that in a moment, but let's just look at this term. What we want to understand is what is the effect of this term on the probability distribution as a function of time. Well, we can kind of sketch that just intuitively. Let's say as a function of x, the probability distribution at some particular time is, say, this. Okay. Now, if I look at x times that, what's that going to do? Well, it's going to skew it a little bit, right? It's going to get a little bit higher on this end and a little bit lower on this end. So the multiplication together of them makes this thing a little bit skewed. Okay? And so if I look at the derivative of this function, this is x times the probability distribution as a function of x. If I look at that, the derivative of that Well, over here, the derivative uh, is positive, and over here, the derivative is negative, right? And this has the effect, this comes down faster such that it pulls this guy, it sort of skews the probability such that it causes it to move in that direction. So the effect of this thing is to cause a drift of the mean value. And in particular, if m1 is positive, then this pulls it towards the origin. Now that's a graphical picture, but we can just see what it does if I look at how does the expected value of x change as a function of time that by definition is equal to uh, the expected value of x, the derivative, the partial derivative of the probability distribution. So this then is equal to the integral over x m1 partial respect to x, x times the probability distribution plus m2 over 2, the second derivative. And if we then do integration by parts, which means throw the derivative on the other side and put a negative sign in where the surface terms go to zero because the probability distribution goes to zero at infinity. Then this term does nothing. This term gives me a minus sign, and this is equal to minus m1x. So the drift coefficient is just the coefficient that describes 
the exponential damping of the mean value towards the origin. And what this says is that it damps equally in x and p. And the damping rate is just what we would expect, kappa over 2. Because, of course, what we get from the Farker-Planck equation better be exactly what we got from the operator Lindblad equation. It's just a different representation of exactly the same thing. So all the quadratures damp, and they damp at this rate. In addition, what we see is diffusion. And the diffusion is not this problem. It's a problem where I look at, okay, here initially is my probability distribution on, say, the x-axis. And the curvature is negative here, and that pulls it down. The curvature is positive here, that pulls it up. And that tends to spread it out. That's diffusion. That's what this derivative is telling me. The second derivative is the curvature. And so what it's saying is that in addition to damping, there is a spreading. And that spreading in this case is due both to the thermal noise and the vacuum noise. So what we're going to finish up this conversation next time is to understand how which of these terms are responsible for decoherence in the system. What we studied is that if we had a coherent state, this thing stayed a coherent state, and it will forever remain that Gaussian packet. It's just that Gaussian drifts. This term does nothing. Uh, but what about other kinds of superpositions? Superpositions that are not coherent states or squeeze states. That's what we're going to look at next time. So we'll continue that discussion on Thursday. All right. Have a good evening, everybody.